Let's move on to our scouting deep dive. Matas Buzelis, probably one of the hottest names, I would say, in consideration for the Charlotte Hornets. Um, I have to say right now that he has a consensus mock draft ranking of around four, according to the rookie scale consensus mock draft. So might not even be there at six, but there are definitely possibilities of him being there. I guess, Chase, can you start by giving people a little bit of introduction about who Matos Bizelis is, what position does he play, what sort of role does he profile, and then we'll get into some of the physical measurements, we'll get into some of the offense, the defense, and what we see in our scout, and also talk about where he ranks on our bid board and, and his fit with the Charlotte Hornets. So, Matos Buzelis is a 19-year-old, 2004-born, small forward. He's from America, but has Lithuanian heritage. Both of his parents are actually professional basketball players, uh, over or were professional basketball players over in Lithuania. Uh, his father specifically played for the national team, I believe, or the Lithuanian Basketball League, and worked for the national team uh, for his post-playing career. So very, very strong basketball bloodline with Matos Buzelis. Uh, he grew up in Chicago, went to a high school in the Chicago area. Uh, and then when COVID happened, he transferred a couple times to Brewster Academy, finished at Sunrise Christian before committing to G League Ignite. Uh, this year, he went there over uh, like Kentucky, UNC, a, a bunch of high-level colleges where basically his other options was super highly recruited, one of the top players in the class. Went Could to have Ignite. got more money. Could have got more money oh, yeah. playing in college through nil yes. than he did with a G League Ignite, which I always think is worth pointing out. 100%. He committed to Ignite. Not in the way that, you know, Scoot Henderson, Jalen Green, like these guys did, because it offered them more money than college. Like he committed to Ignite because he believed in that developmental pathway, which is something that really shines through uh, in his interviews. And when anybody asks him about his experience with Ignite, he seems like someone that really enjoyed it and appreciated what the program did for him, despite the fact that it was shuttered just a month or two ago. Um, but Modest Buzelis entered Ignite as kind of a more of a playmaking, like shooting, scoring wing is now a kind of two-way forward, spot-up shooter, weak side rim protector. Just had a really interesting development and made a lot of changes to his game over the last year plus. Uh, in my eyes, it's bolstered his draft stock quite a bit, given him a much higher floor maybe than he would have had uh, when he, especially back at Brewster and in Sunrise Christian Academy, was like a ball-handling wing that made plays going downhill and read the defense really well was really rough as a shooter efficiency wise back then has bumped it up slightly now and especially on film looks like a much better shooter now and so, while sacrificing some of that ball handling responsibility but still pops as a connective passer and just a generally smart player on both ends of the floor so that is the the skinny on Matis Buzelis but we're going to get much deeper than that over the next 48 hours when we're going to be talking about him right now you um you said right at the start he's a small forward. Do you, do you think that the position you think he plays in the league? Because I think that's up for debate, right? I like I so I kind of viewed him as a power forward all year. And then the more I've dug into the tape, I actually think he could play some three. And now I'm not sure. Like I think it's to be determined. But uh yeah, I'm curious. Do you do you specifically view him as a three? Uh no, I actually only said that because that's what he is like listed as if you Google him. I personally yeah. view him as Pretty much the opposite, like strictly a four. Like I think he is like a spot up shooting, face up, like two way impact four that kind of just makes his hay like off the ball pretty much entirely, both as a defender and offensive player. Uh, and doesn't really have much of the like explosiveness or burst or ball handling, like creative playmaking vision that you would expect from an NBA wing, uh, but still has, you know, tons of traits that would play very well um especially on like a competitive team um so I, I i view him definitely as a four and that's part of the reason why i'm so high on him originally i wasn't as high on him when i looked at him as like a like a playmaking wing like i believe if you look up his high school uh profile on 247 sports which is like a scouting service and just read about his high school career and trajectory i believe he's referred to in his scouting report as a playmaking wing like multiple times that is just not the case at all with what he was with Ignite. I believe he oh. only had like 60-something assists on the year. Uh, while he averaged, yep. I think, two blocks per game in the regular season and only like two 
assists, maybe even less than that. So completely changed his game to becoming like an impact defender rather than like an impact ball handler, which is really interesting to me. And having knowledge of that high school reputation is important because we saw it with Brandon Miller just Mm -hmm. this year, right? He didn't shoot. I think he shot eight mid-range shots at Alabama. Comes into the NBA, shooting a lot of mid-range. And that's just because the system they had at Alabama took that away, right? It's not what he was asked to do. But if you looked at the high school tape, if you looked at any of the kind of Jordan classic, McDonald's and Americans, like the mid-range game was like where he liked to operate. And it's always important, I think, when you talk about what is some of like the upside, maybe what did this prospect not get to show, you take into account the high school tape. Because I'll be honest, Chase, I think he had 77 turnovers to 70 assists for the season. Um, the passing was like the playmaking flashes were just not really there. I watched a good portion. I think I watched about half his assists for the whole year before today's pod. And even those assists are like, you know, just a swing pass or it's a DHO and he's passed it to a point. Like he is very, very rarely this year kind of broke down the dribble or kind of created an assist through like a creative passing, either looking someone off or, or reading the defense. And I maybe there is something more in there and we just didn't get to see it. But that is like a question mark for me. And that's why I think having that knowledge of high school is so important. I actually noticed that exact thing today. He is almost exclusively like a connective passer and the term hockey assist, like that applies to him very strongly as a passer. He gets so many assists by just being in the right spot and then just moving the ball to one pass away, like spotting up in the corner. He's very effective doing that because he draws, you know, defenses have to guard him when he catches the ball there. He can just immediately swing that ball to the next player on the wing. He got, I think, at least four or five assists doing that in just the clips that I watched today, which were not even all of his assists from the year. So he is definitely somebody that's like just a smart player and knows what to do with the basketball. Like in the it's NBA, it's like, yeah, right. It, very me, those simple. Passes though, that like if you're playing in the NBA, you have to. Like if you're not to make, yeah, if you're not getting the assist that he's getting, then you're not playing. Right. Right. The, right. There is nothing advanced. It's just like the most basic. Oh, the defense are tilted and rotated. There's a wide open man, and that's why. I didn't see anything from a playmaking perspective that really impressed me, which again, when you think about what the play he was built to be, you expect him to see more of that. And and that Ignite team, it's not like it had a bunch of great point guards. That was a real issue for them in terms of like creating good offense. So you feel like if there was that opportunity, they would have put the ball in his hands more and they chose not to. And that there has to be a reason for that. Maybe it's turnover issues. You know, he averaged over two turnovers a game. I, I, I'm not sure, uh, but I, I do think there's something more there than we saw. But I'm like, I'm not going into this being like, oh, yeah, he's a playmaking wing. I, I don't know if he is. I actually kind of think that maybe that could come further down the line. I don't think that's why he's going to get on the floor early in his NBA career. No, I, I completely agree. I could see him. Honestly, I could maybe see him being like a short role playmaker at some point because he makes these decisions quickly. They're just, like you said, not advanced really in any way. They're just plays that move the ball along and produce like a good shot and effective possession. There, it's nothing creative or manipulative that he is, you know, creating himself. But I definitely could see like the short roll is a good situation to put guys like that in because, you know, you play a classic like four on three. Once you eliminate the guy that got screened out of the possession, either draw the help or don't draw the help and finish. Like it's a very, not simple, but a much easier progression than being an initiator who has to bring the ball up the court, survey the entire floor, either get the call from whatever their coach wants to run or make one themselves, decide what is what matchup is the best and where to go with the ball first. And that's just a much longer process for somebody like Modis, who clearly doesn't have like the ball handling ability to maximize that either. He's not very strong. He gets bumped off of his path a lot. And that's like, I, uh, like almost a non-starter for somebody that wants to be like a playmaker on the move. You need to be able to play through contact in some way or be like a really, really good ball handler where you don't have to play through contact or take that much. He's obviously neither of those things. He's just like a, like I see the term upright with him a lot. And I wanted to get your opinion on this as well. I think it's like the opposite. He actually gets like pretty low to the ground 
when he dribbles. He just doesn't have like a tight ball handle or ball handling ability. And his arms, like he being 6'10", his arms aren't like that long, but they're long when you get that low to the ground. And it's just not, it's just not an easy thing to for somebody that's that tall to be like an effective dribbler in traffic going downhill. Unless, you, like I said, you are an absolutely elite ball handler or you're really strong. He's neither of those things. So it tends to look really bad. And that's where a lot of his turnovers come from. Whereas like, like we just said, like he's not, he just makes like smart plays, right passes. He doesn't like chuck the ball into a passing lane and have it get easy an easy deflection and go the other way. It's more, he just gets ripped or bumped off of his spot or loses the ball and falls over like type of stuff like that, which is either correctable or it's just a sign that he can't handle physicality, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it. So if he was six seven, I'd agree with you. But this guy, this guy is a guy who's gonna play like just six, just short of six ten. And I think when you're that big, I, I actually think that like for his size, he has some ball handling skill and ability that not a lot of guys at that six nine, six ten size have. Um, but more more geared towards scoring, like getting to a turnaround, getting to an up and under, like he has great footwork. Um, and he can do kind of like a lot of stop start hesitation. They're more plays to create opportunities for himself to score, but he sometimes doesn't do those like kind of draw the defense and then pass out to them. So I, like, I actually don't mind the handle at times. Like there are absolutely times like for anyone who's that age and doesn't have that strength to kind of shield the ball, there's just going to be opportunities where you turn the ball over. But I do find that he does have some ambition there and he, he kind of tries things, which I think some people like, his size wouldn't even look anywhere near. So I'm probably a little bit different on, on that. Um, We talked about the playmaking, the passing. Let's move on to the scoring. And I will let you choose if you want to talk about his, you know, his scoring inside the arc, outside the arc, at the rim. You can choose where you want to go. What are you drawn to? So this is like exactly what makes me view him as a four. I think he has a fantastic post game for somebody his size. And like you said, the ball handling there in that specific aspect, I actually do agree with that. That is pretty good. Mm. Creating off the dribble from the perimeter, not good. He does have really, really good footwork. He doesn't really get stripped often in that regard, like going up for his shot. He doesn't get it knocked out of his hands or anything. He, he plays off of two feet very well. And that's something that you hear a lot more now because the Knicks run – with Jalen Brunson, which, oh, so sad that that ended the other day. But um, that, like, that's something you really only hear in terms of like small guards and their ability to like leverage some sort of like skill or footwork to count counteract their lack of size or athleticism or both. But like Modest does that while like leveraging his size. And obviously he has to do that because he can't just like dunk, jump up and dunk on people as easily as someone exactly. like Ron Holland or Tyler Smith, but man, has he compensated for that. He is like so skilled with and quick in his footwork. He, he always has a really wide base, which is important for somebody that's not strong to not get knocked off of every single movement that you try to make. And once I think he gets a little bit stronger in like his chest and his shoulders, when you combine that like really good fundamental base with actual like NBA strength, and then the ability to go from like having the ball at your chin to a full extension, like finishing with either hand around a contest or contact or whatever, he's going to be really, really effective scoring one on one in the interior. And that's not something that's like super prominent in the NBA anymore, but it is in the postseason for one when the game like slows down a little bit and there are times where you just need points and he's going to be able to provide that, I think, to a pretty substantial degree i think for somebody who's like like we said not like really strong or really a big at all he's more of a forward but i think he has some very advanced post moves and face up scoring ability i think you're going look we're going to talk about strength being an issue all the way through this um he is what was he listed at the combine 190 like something pounds. yeah 197 pounds to put that into perspective, Reed Shepard, who's six foot two, is 187 pounds. <laughs> uh, and he's got another, you know, seven, eight inches on him. The one thing I will say, he is, he lacks strength, but he does not play 
with the fear of being weaker than someone. A little bit like Chet Holmgren, right? Chet is super skinny, but he is tough. He goes into people's chests. He flies in for rebounds. Like, he makes himself felt, even though he is super skinny and has a very narrow hips and narrow base. And I think Buzelas has a little bit of that. And that gives me uh, optimism that, like, he, you know, you see some people and they just always, like, fading away from the contact. They're shying away from everything. And that's not what he does. And, and yeah, he like, his frame, let's be honest, I, I don't think it's a frame that's going to put on loads of weight. It is super narrow and skinny in all aspects. But he doesn't play like it. And I guess that's what I, I wanted to point out. Um, you talked about his kind of like post game and footwork. You, you're absolutely, this is the thing that like six, 10 guys just don't have the skill that he has where he is, you know, up and unders, uh, fadeaways, spin moves. He uses all of those things that make up his lack of wingspan. Um, maybe his last of like, I actually think he's a really good athlete. This is like my like sneaky take. I, I think he's a very fluid athlete. This is a guy again. He was a, Gonna be could have been like one of the best swimmers in the country. He is just a natural athlete. You just never ever look at him and think he's an athlete. You'd actually think he's a stiff, right? Because of just like how he looks. But he just doesn't play that way. I think he had was it forty two dunks this year. He's had some mm -hmm. like nasty dunks on people. Tries to dunk on people. Gets up for alley oops. Like that's not something that you think when you kind of tune in and you see the guy of what you're gonna see. But, I mean, he had Alex Saar on one of those up and unders, which, like, in the game against Perth, where just completely, you know, fade away. Alex Saar jumped to the shot fake, and he was able to duck under and finish at the rim. And I think you're going to be seeing that for, for years with Bizellas, because you're going to have a lot of bigs thinking, I'm going to block this guy's shot, and he's just so skilled. And I think the game moves really slow for him when he's doing that. Like, he can read and react to whatever the defense are doing, and kind of do exactly what they're giving him, right? So if they're playing up in him, he can spin that way. Um, if they're really high up in him, they can like leverage and use it to turn away for the fadeaway on that like baseline. He's got that as well. He can shoot over people because of that size. He is a extremely skilled operator within 15 feet, you know, when he's just not at a huge strength disadvantage, right, basically. His field goal percentage from 17 feet and in, in the G League, as a teenager who weighs 197 pounds at 6'10", is 44%. That's not a fantastic number like on its face, but when you consider the context that he played in without a point guard as well, yeah. who was um, you had almost nobody collapsing the defense other than modest Ron, Ron Holland and at times like London Johnson or Bob Carsonet. Like, that is a really, really impressive number to me. Especially With a heavy dose of, like, mid-range shots and fadeaways. Yes. And this isn't exactly. like he's just taking layups for that, right? No. Which if that he's not like case, an off-ball cutter getting lobs yeah, and, like, exactly. easy dunker spot opportunities. Like, these are self-created buckets that he's taking, like, three to four dribbles to get there. And I, I'm, his up and unders, he had one against Charles Bassey in one of the games they played against the Austin Spurs that was – legitimately insane how much cover how much ground he covered with his pivots yeah. and just how smooth and quick that he bounced from like one foot to another and did like a full 180 and got all the way around Bassey in the matter of like a quarter of a second it was it was just like an NBA yeah. move he has a I, lot of moves that you true. watch and you're like this is an NBA move that's what they do this is what players that are his size and his skill level do in the NBA and those players make a lot of money and play for a long time. So if, if Buzelis can, you know, pick up the things that we talked about, like his ball handling a little bit, get a little bit stronger. Like, I don't know. I just find it so hard to believe that a guy this skilled is going to just like outright fail. Like there's no, it's very, very rare. To, that he I think, completely like that mitigates, not completely, but he does as good a job as you can of mitigating his lack of strength and length because he just moves the defenders. Like, they're out of position, they're having to foul them. Like, it doesn't matter if you don't have the strength to finish through someone if, like, you just outsmarted them and you're able to find your way to step around them. You know, he's had loads of reverse finishes, like, use the other side of the rim several times driving along the baseline. 
like again comfortable like going up and under kind of doing the the classic kind of like Gerald Wallace how he used to see it, like go up and under and round like at 610 at that size that is just hard to stop um so he's super creative and advanced for his age um let's let's talk a little bit about the three point shot um and i i had a graphic some people might have seen it uh, about Bizellis. um he didn't shoot a great ball if you look at the roll percentages this year it's 26% from three um, you'll hear everybody in the media talking about how he shot 45% in his final year at Sunrise Christian Academy from three and that people think he's a better three-point shooter than he is. Um, I have to say, I completely buy it. I really do. I, I do not think Matas Bizelis is going to be a sub-30% shooter in the NBA. Um, if you look at the advanced numbers, again, they're still not great. He shot 29% on open catch and shoots. 26% on contested catch and shoots. Um, basically, did not take any shots. He took eight shots off total, five off the dribble, three step backs, and he hit one of them. So he is by no means like a guy who's going to kind of be, you know, dribbling, relocating, firing away. But out of 110 attempts from three, he had only five bad misses, which is like I class bad miss as a like an air ball, something that hits the backboard first, or like you barely kind of graze the rim, or you hit the rim really hard and it bounces back really far. Like all the shots make sense, and that, that was like kind of what I really stood out to me. He is really picturesque, repeatable mechanics. It seems really balanced. Um, he just looked like someone who, like he looked like he'd been shooting in the NBA for years. It just didn't go in, um, and I, I don't think it was the best context. I want that open catch and shoot number to be a little bit higher, but I just have to say, I think there's an element of him probably being tired, getting worn down um, over the long NBA season and, and maybe just being a little bit winded. And maybe that's why his percentages were down because he doesn't really take bad shots. Like he's just like a pick and pop threat. He did it so well. He slid, he went to the corners, he spaced the floor. Um, if there was like, even his free throw percentage this year was not good. It was, I think, what was it in total? 60, uh, 70% finished for the, for the mm -hmm. year. Just under 70%. All these markers are not good for his shooting. But I'm just telling you, I, I believe in it because I watched every single three-point attempt that he's taken this year. And I just believe in the form. I believe in the skill level. I believe in the touch. Um, I think it's going to come around. He went from the high school line straight to the NBA line. That's a challenge. I think a lot of it is going to be strength-based with him. You look at his frame, and I think that's something that he will never fill out like thick, but he'll get stronger, and that will help with the three-point side because so many of his misses were short. So I, I must be 30%, 40%. I just think he was struggling with the distance. I don't think there's anything wrong with the form or with the touch. Totally agree. Him and Zachary Risa actually are essentially a case study. If they, Assuming they do end up being like high level NBA shooters, they're going to be a case study for why film and volume are critically important, if not the only important things when it comes to like a three point shooting projection going forward, because neither of them really <laughs> have shot like well, especially over a large sample size. Uh, Modest Buzelis, if we're, this is going back to high school. So with Ignite below 30%, with expressions at uh, his last. Uh, a Houston on the EYBL circuit from catch and shoot or from a uh, three point jump shots, 28.8% with Brewster Academy. He was again, 16.7% sunrise Christian. He was at 43%. So obviously it's there. Like he has the ability to shoot a high percentage over a long or a large sample size, but it's, he just is somebody that's clearly going to take a little bit to adjust to the efficiency and the pace that you have to play at. Cause with every, like level of competition that he's faced, he's had good stretches and bad stretches, but he's so young and has such a like underdeveloped frame that you could very easily see those things coming around. And especially the uh, off the dribble shooting, you mentioned that he made like one for on one the ten. entire season. Yeah. Just like a total non-threat as soon as he puts the ball on the floor, essentially uh, from beyond the three point line to shoot and score. I think a lot of that is because Which he's is not strange strong. because like we talked earlier about the, the fadeaways, like, you know, the, he can shoot off the dribble in the mid range. 
Yeah. Um, so he I think, has I think it's totally his strength. Coordination and footwork. I, like, he didn't take many of it. It took 10 for the whole year. That's basically nothing. I do think there was an element, and this is something that I like, like, he he stuck to his role. Like, the, all of his shots were shots that you could tell the G League Ignite had, they, they were in the flow of the offense shots. It wasn't like him going, nah, I'm going to get mine now, which there might be another Ignite prospect who we'll talk about in future episodes who, uh, who had some of those moments. Um, and, and I like that he didn't do that. He played to his role and he tried to execute it. Yeah, he definitely is like, he has the most like team friendly or had the most like team friendly style of anybody that was on that Ignite team. And if they had a point guard, like I think he would have been somebody that would have benefited mm. even, I mean, all of them would have, because pretty much like him, Holland and Tyler Smith are all archetypes of players that like could really use a good lead guard that can set the table and put them in better positions than they can as initiators. But Modest especially would have benefited really strongly from somebody just creating open pockets of space other than himself and Holland and Tyler Smith, who were not experienced enough to like really take advantage of that, whether that was with their feel and processing or with their frame and NBA or ability to handle NBA physicality, which was the case with Modest for much of the year. But I actually mentioned this with uh, on the podcast with Tyler Metcalf last week. He did get better at it. I thought at handling just the general like physicality and, there were fewer instances of him getting taken advantage of on either end of the court because of his lack of strength, I think, as the year went on than there were like at the beginning of the year during the Showcase Cup, per se, in the first like 16-game sample of the season. I think he got a lot better at that once he really realized like how physical some of the guys are in the G League and <laughs> with how many fouls tend to go by the wayside <laughs> in that league as well. <laughs> And because of his threat that we talked about, like attacking the rim and, and getting to like, you know, that, that kind of like mid range area and executing from there. Like if you, if he can shoot it, teams close out hard on him. He can put the ball on the floor. He can then start to attack. That really opens things up for him as well. Um, We're going to move on to the defense in a second. The last thing I want to mention is just his cutting. I think it was like only eight, 9% of his total uh, possessions, but, I, I really like him as a cutter. I think he's really smart. I mean, that team we talked about earlier, you talk about helping with the point guard. I think his cutting percentages would have gone way up. Um, sneaks along the baseline well. Um, you know, where, once a kind of there's been a drive or someone's gnashing it, he like he really what does timely cuts and like has shows explosion. That's where a lot of his dunks came actually off cuts, where he had a little bit of a runway um, to to kind of load up. So. Uh, I, I like his cutting side, which again pr profiles really well off the ball. If you think in Charlotte, um, let's go to the defense. Uh, where do you want to go? Do you want to go to the rebounding, the man defense, or the team defense? Before we start, do you mind if we pause for like two minutes? I have to pee. So, why don't we start at the top with this one? I mean, I think his off-ball defense is basically the selling point for him on defense. As we said, again, the strength is an issue, which directly lends itself to subpar probably at best on-ball defense, especially in, a, in the G League where guys are pretty strong and physical. There are a lot of NBA caliber athletes that he was guarding on a nightly basis, whereas in college or overseas, maybe he wouldn't have had to deal with that quite as much. So we got to see maybe more of the low lights on that end than we perhaps would have in the context that Modest was playing in this year than he would, would have been if he was in college. But his team defense is really, really good. It's clear, I think, that he has like an NBA brain on that end. He processes things really quickly, never laid in rotation. 6'10 with at least semi-positive length, even though it's only about an inch longer than his actual height, his 6'10 wingspan is more than useful when it comes to deflections and he plays really well with his arms out. He always is in position to get deflections and at least deter people from making passes in certain directions, cuts down angles and stuff like that. So not necessarily somebody that's like a lockdown defender per se, but he led his team in stocks. He had 92 stocks on the season, which is really impressive to me only playing 50 games. And I mentioned earlier, he averaged two blocks per game in the G league in the regular season. That was seventh in the entire league in blocks per game. Like wow. a 6'10 teenager who is really thin 
and playing his first ever season of professional basketball, blocked more shots than these are some of the players below him. Tony Bradley, like five year at least NBA veteran. EJ Liddell, highly not highly drafted, but was given a guaranteed contract last year by the New Orleans Pelicans. Wenyan Gabriel entered this season on the Boston Celtics NBA training camp roster, has played in the NBA in the past. Like these are guys that are like seasoned veterans have already played in the NBA, have gotten that opportunity that Modest hasn't gotten yet. And he was markedly better than all of them. So at least in the shot blocking department. Yeah. So that and is super promising to me. That comes to me, like you say, normally shot blockers, you think they're super long, long arms. That's what normally yeah. you think. For me, it comes from a few things. He's a very good athlete for his size. And we talked about that already at the draft combine. We, we talked about how he finished top 10 and like and everything that that is basically what he's there for like you know he has he's a quick jumper he is able to slide with guys really well so they think they're past him and he's not actually out the play and there's quite a few of his blocks he got picked up where he's sliding with the ball and he's just kind of waiting for them to go up and they can get up quickly and it's not super high but it's high enough and it's, it's a quick you know quick jumper um he has great instincts of when to help when like he knows people are he knows he's out the play that the opposition player doesn't know he's there and he's kind of able to cheat and help and just the timing with that combined with just a really good motor and i think that comes through both in the shot blocking but also in the rebounding i mean for him to rebound the ball he had several games where he was you know got 12 13 14 rebounds i think it's six and a half for the season now look the Ignite had a lot of missed shots to rebound, but some of the rebounds he was going up and getting, like a lot of offensive tips, like active around Very the rim. Very contested that side. rebounds. Yeah. Super contested. And when we talk about him playing with like some of that like motor, some of the physicality that I talked about earlier, even though lacking strength, that's where that really shows up. And like that Ignite situation was so bad. Like who would have probably like played? It must have been so hard to bring yourself to play with that level of defensive effort and energy every single night in the G League, when you're 2 and 30, whatever, like everything's falling apart and he's out there just like grinding it defensively against these guys who are 10 years older than him, weigh 30 more pounds than him. And for me, that showed me something in terms of like who he is as a person, just like that approach. Um, and he never took a night off and played it really, really hard. So I was super impressed with the defensive side. Um, I think if he's a four, like we said earlier, like he's probably around the rim enough that he's almost like a stretch four with some shot blocking potential, um, which is obviously something that would be be very welcome. The stretch side, I understand some people just won't believe it because the history of percentages tell us it's it's unlikely to be true. And, and I get that. But that's why he's not even higher on my board because I think he's going to shoot it, but there aren't great indicators there. But on the defensive side... Um, it's it's definitely a an area for him that you look at him as a player and you go, well, he's not going to be a defensive different maker. And then you watch the film and it really jumps off the screen. And you just said his role as a four man here. I just want to throw out a d defense only comparison here. How much Jaden McDaniels do you think he has in him defensively? He's probably not the like perimeter guy. But yeah, that like no. four as a weak or a four, like role as a weak side rim protector at the four, the ability to just kind of use your length and fluidity rather than being like a really strong guy. And Jade McDaniels, he only has a seven foot wingspan. He's not, you know, someone with like a he's six ten with a seven four wingspan. It's pretty similar build to Modest and being a little bit under six nine in shoes with a six ten wingspan. I think McDaniels was probably also a little under six nine in shoes with a seven foot wingspan, so a little bit longer. But I actually think he has a lot of overlapping qualities with him in terms of the way that he like processes the game as well and how quickly he makes those rotations. The ability for him to get up and not have it like put himself at risk for a foul and just use his arms and his hands to get in the way. Amadis, I think, is a very similar style of like weak side rim protection to McDaniels. Well, obviously again, not the perimeter like one-on-one -on -one defender, but in that specific area, I think he's pretty similar. Mm. Okay. Let's move on to 
maybe some of the weaknesses. I mean, we've talked around some of these, you know, the foot speed will probably be a problem defensively. Like, I, I actually think, like, we've talked about it's not bad, but the fact that it's only okay combined with them, people are just going to go through his chest. <laughs> And, and that's where you start to say, like, he's not going to be able to keep guys fully in front of him. But even if he slides, some people are just going to kind of like barrel into his chest and are just going to move him. And that's going to be his biggest issue. Like, strength is such a big thing in the NBA. Like, even more so in this new NBA or where the rules and how it's officiated, like, teams are able to get off with a lot more. Like, he is going to get, he's going to have to run into some tough screens. He's going to have be switched on to big guys. He battles well. But, I think he's going to be pretty foul prone because he's not going to give up. He's going to try and fight hard. And we already saw some of that in the G League. Like he picked up quite, had quite a few high fouls game. They just played him anyway because like they didn't really care if he had high fouls. He was there to develop basically. But I do think he was going to have an issue staying on the court, staying out of foul trouble early. It doesn't matter what we've seen on film. As soon as NBA teams see him come on the court, they are going to go at him straight away. To be to his credit, though, he has plenty of experience with that playing for Ignite because yeah. that that same thing happened to him Everyone wants every to game with that. Ignite. To, exactly, <laughs> every team that plays Ignite, that is the biggest game in that you know ten game stretch or in that month for them. Everyone wanted to beat that team, and obviously, most teams were successful this year with them finishing two and thirty one uh, in the regular season. But yeah, that I think is what really limits him maybe defensively. Like, I still think he's going to be very good, especially in a, a team regard or team context. He's just not going to be like a lockdown perimeter defender. His very average lateral quickness, I think. He's very, like, fluid and moves well, but isn't just a guy that's going to, like, lock that, like, get down in a stance and slide in the open court and be able to stick with it, especially guys that are smaller than him and, like, wings that are stronger guards are probably a little bit too quick as well so there's very limited versatility i think out of the jump or out of the gate for him he's probably only going to be able to guard like fellow six nine six ten thinner guys which there aren't a ton of in the nba that are playing like big minutes likely in the way that he will but i mean i I'll, i think obviously he has a lot more shot blocking ability weak side rim protection just general feel for the game on that end ability to make plays generate new possessions for your team and turn the opponent over, which is the most important thing in defense is just being able to create extra possessions for your own team. He does that at a much higher level than those other skinny 6'10 guys do typically. So he has that going for him, which I think will carry him a long way. And once the strength comes around, but I, I totally agree that he's not going to be very effective on ball and will probably get put on an island a lot and will have very you know, low light clips, we'll put it that way, and that will circulate on Twitter and probably give off the perception that he's not a good defender. But I think he will at least make up for it, if not eventually end up surpassing or mitigating that problem down the line once he gets stronger. Even if you're not a great – as long as you can, like, pick up blocks, you can yeah. rebound the ball well. Like, if you can provide rim protection and rebound the ball well – like you make up for some of those situations where you are, you know, you, you're just beaten or guys pile through you and stuff like that. So you just need to have enough of those other moments, right? And and that's what needs to try and help you push back. Um, we talked a little bit about the passing, some of the some of the ball handling. I think that's absolutely definitely something his ability to create offense is gonna be a struggle. I think. He is someone to me that you need to give him the ball to score. Like he needs to be fed the ball. I I, we, I like his cutting, but early on, he's probably not going to be the shooter that you want to do. How's he going to get on the floor? His strength is like, we even saw it in like the Rising Stars game. I think he hit the game winner over Bra a very what Brandon Miller, actually, which is one of his turnaround baseline fadeaways. Is he going to get the green light to do that in the NBA? I think he has to because that's where he like provides some of that value. But there's just not many rookies who take baseline fadeaways in the NBA. It's just there it just isn't because like there's not many people can make them like that kind of clip where it's actually an efficient and a good shot for the team. But I want him to go somewhere where he is able to really explore that side of things. 
and and is a little bit empowered. Like someone like Washington would be a, a good spot for him because that's where I really see his surplus value as being like an option in the half court. He can be a mismatch option, right? You switch a smaller guy onto him, he can just turn around and shoot over him. He is going to be a mismatch killer for sure because yeah. he does have like he has the perception of being somebody that's like easier to guard for a smaller guy because he's so thin and doesn't have like elite burst or explosiveness off the dribble, but he's just going to be able to shoot over the top of you because he's so skilled. And I think that's going to be something that teams really underestimate like coming into the league is just how much touch he has as a shooter. Like that's why he has so many of these makes through shooting, you know, sub 30% that make you go, yeah, he can shoot is because he has elite shooting touch. And when it goes in, they are very, very pure makes that you can tell are replicable. It's just the rate at which they are replicated has not matched up to what you want from somebody that's billed as a shooter, or at least is going to be taking a lot of them. But if you put him in situations like that, like where you're just giving him the easiest route to score possible that he could possibly have really like, that's just going to build confidence and eventually will ho- or hopefully will eventually help him build a rhythm to shoot from three and be able to expand that scoring out beyond the arc and take advantage of those mismatches in slightly different ways rather than just being like a post score that shoots over the top. But I, I totally agree. Like he does need to have the green light to shoot those kinds of shots. Even if he's shooting 41% from the field, 31% from three through two months of the year. Like I feel like that's just kind of how you're going to get him into like the NBA role that he's going to play and be comfortable with that type of thing. And because of the type of shots that he takes, I don't think he's actually ever going to be a super efficient NBA player, but he's going to make shots that not many players can make Um, because he's never going to like really beat his man all the way and get to the rim and just kind of explode for layup. He's probably not going to live at the foul line because he's going to be at such a strength disadvantage, even though he's got craft. I think like you see some of his finishes, they're a lot of time like kind of over people using a skill and and creating those little seams. I didn't ever see him being like a super efficient guy, but being a guy that like he can go score when you're really struggling, when you haven't got anything going, you can throw it into Bazellis and he can try and get you like a, a shot that might be better than what the rest of your offense can go. So I think there's a little bit of tempering expectations like the, the shooting track record, even though I think we're both buying the shot, he's never going to be a great shooter. Like, I think we've got enough idea that, like, he can be good enough at 6'10 to be a rebounding, shot blocking stretch four if he shoots like 35%. But I, I never think he's going to be a super efficient player for, the, for the, just the deficiencies in that area. Yeah, unless he really adjusts his play style. As yeah, well, which, which he's not going to because you've got he's got a place of strengths, right? He has right, to play exa- he, you know, and like he, he's just and he's just came up playing that way for so long and being somebody that at least has like a relatively high usage rate or is a top two, three option on their team offensively. He's not gonna be that like right away, most likely, unless he gets drafted by like Washington or something. Like if he gets picked up by I highly doubt he's going one, but say Atlanta trades back to three or something, or he gets picked up by Charlotte, for example, like he's not going to be even the number two option. The number three is at at the absolute best. Like he's going to have to adjust in some way, but I don't really see him like sacrificing volume to that degree without it being like a pretty similar experience to what we got with Ignite, where he, he was a featured option with them, but he wasn't efficient with the shots that he got because he wasn't able to like truly expand his game because they didn't have a point guard, like you said, anybody to set him up like that. So he suffered from that, having to create a lot of his shots on his own right. But in the NBA, that won't happen. You just have to actually let him take those shots once they're created for him, for him to be able to like truly reach his ceiling. Okay. Um, before we got into this fit with Charlotte Hornets, Chase, where is Buzelis on your board? And did he move up or down after this exercise? Matos Buzelis is number four on my big board. He actually didn't move up or down. He's been there, I think, for probably like two or three weeks now. I've, I've originally had him at three. I just flipped uh, him and Ron Holland after I had been watching the two of them quite a bit 
over the last couple of weeks. So firmly a top player in this draft for me, like wouldn't be opposed to him going number two. I don't think I would take him number one. That would have to be a very specific fit thing for me, but okay. really anywhere two onward, I think would be an appropriate draft position for Modest Buzelis. Where do you have him on your big board, James? I, I moved him up. Um, I moved him up one spot. He is now up to six uh, for me. So, um, again, right where the Charlotte Hornets are due to pick. And speaking of picking six, let's talk a little bit about his fit with the Charlotte Hornets. Um, I'll go first. I think the Charlotte Hornets are a team who struggle for strength, toughness, defensive impact. Um, and that is already kind of a symptom because you look at our guys, the key starters, Lamella Ball, Brandon Miller, Mark Williams. I don't think you use strength or toughness to describe any of those three players. And I don't think they're necessarily what you'd start Bazellus. And I meant to mean toughness. I kind of mean like physicality, I guess, more than, than toughness. Um, and I do think Bazellus fits a little bit into that same area he plays with passion and fire as we already talked about but he is still deficient in some of those areas if miles comes back it is a crowded front court with miles bridges and grant williams and matas buzelis i i don't know if he definitely gets minutes equally i think he can play definitely with miles um and i think he could also play with grant maybe as grant is a small ball five um they do need some half court Scoring like the Mellow Ball is a great transition play. He's not a great interior uh, half court player. Neither is Brandon Miller. I think he gives you something a different dynamic on offense, um, and you know someone that you could maybe draw a double inside, which isn't necessarily something that they have. And I think his rebounding and shot blocking and off ball defense would be a good addition. But I do think a lot does depend on if Miles Bridges is coming back or not. Um, so I would say his defense with Charlotte. It does make sense, but I also see the you're committing to the strength, physicality, getting bullied by every team every night. Like that just feels like that theme will continue if your core four players are, are they, who those four would be. So I think it's it, it's it's good to an, an extent because I think four is one position maybe open for upgrade, but it's not brilliant. I completely agree. He's not somebody I would say is like a bad fit, but he's definitely not on my short list of like good fits per se at number six. If he's even available, then we'll have to see. But he, yeah, I, I don't know if, if so say Modest is available at six, he's, you know, perceived as the best prospect available. Mm -hmm. Do you take him knowing that we both feel almost the exact same about his fit with Charlotte because for all the reasons that you just said, I, I don't think I would add somebody who's like contact averse or not physical to this core currently. Do you trade that pick or do you just make it anyway, knowing he's like the best player there and that if you drop down however many spots, you may not get somebody that has his upside or his ability to be like a mismatch in that sense that the Hornets don't have. And so it's it super always, tough. To, I have no idea what I would answer that question. That's why it, al it always depends who else you're telling me is available, right? But um, I would select him because I don't think you can not select someone due to fit for this Charlotte Hornets roster, irrelevant of like the core, because we don't know if the, you know, Mark Williams, I, I know we're like, we think he's going to be part of the core and we want him to be. The injury stuff in two seasons is a little bit worrying. Lamelo Ball, like I, I'm not ruling out that in the next two to three years he might be not in Charlotte anymore, and in that case, that's probably when Buzelis is coming to his best. Um, so I'm not, I'm not ruling it out. Um, I think it's, it would excite me in some ways because he could clearly fit into that four position, and I could see, especially in offense, how it would work. Um, it's the defensive side which would give me some pause for concern. And that just means you're going to have to have like the nastiest, most physical mother effer ever, like playing the two next to the <laughs> ball and Brandon Miller in that situation. But um, I, I do, I do see it. I see it. So I would draft him. Yes. I think I'd be excited if they, if they end up with this draft with Buzelis, 
I would be excited because I think there's a bunch of ways you can use him which are unique, which a lot of other players, like, I know what their role is going to be in the NBA. I know how they're going to impact the game. And I think Buzelis has a little bit of, you know, a little bit of that special dust, which you don't see every time when you evaluate prospects. And that is exciting. I agree. He definitely has a level of intrigue that is, like, too high to pass up on yes. almost but i do i would say that if you draft him you have to move miles bridges cuz you're not going to move brandon miller you're not going to move lamelo ball could miles not play the 3 and brandon miller the 2 i i actually that's how i'm envisioning it i, I think that yeah. lineup absolutely bleeds points i don't think that you are versatile enough to do that i don't know if you have enough especially in the front court enough like physicality and strength and just like brute force and toughness, especially that you need to be like a deep playoff team. But even in the regular season and just grinding from October to mid April, that is just a team of really skinny dudes. And then one dude who's built like a Mack truck, but for whatever reason, can't use it to be effective and then Mark has yet to play a full NBA season's worth of games in two years. So you're really, really banking on the like for the, like the career trajectory of multiple players skyrocketing over the next couple of years, I think, for Bazellus to be like a really good fit long term. But I I I think I agree that you just kind of gotta do it rather than trade down to eleven and take like Dalton connect or something like that and have it just be like a guaranteed like eighth through 10th man that you just picked. Like at least with Bazellus, you might be getting a long-term starter. I think anyway, he has that ceiling, maybe yeah. not like all-star level, but definitely somebody that could be a starter. Choose, he doesn't stop. Like, no, just, yeah, exactly. 